Observing the styles and body shapes that both gay and straight society deem attractive inevitably has an impact upon gay men's appearance. Brian Pronger contends that, in the move away from effeminacy as an outward sign of homosexuality, muscularity is not merely a substitute for makeup, but differs in the content of the excess. As the well-toned muscular body appeared to present a form of hegemonic masculinity, gay gym use increased to such an extent that the muscular gay body became the new stereotyped gay body by the early 1990s. For Daniel Harris, the development of this muscular gay body was a means of creating a commonality, of inventing, and I quote, those missing physical features that enable us to spot imperceptible compatriots who would remain unseen and anonymous if they did not prominently display on their own bodies, end of quote. Nick Cook, who began going to gay clubs in London in the early 1990s, recalled how sportswear such as athletic t-shirts, tank tops, and cycling shorts were, and I quote, great for showing off your body. Eric Goodman observed that today, and I quote, in Chelsea, there are a lot of people who dress athletic. They wear a lot of tank tops showing off their muscles. David McGovern continues with this, uh, contending that the tank top is a quintessential gay item of clothing that, again, shows off the body. And thus, as he says, many people consider to be the majority of gay style. Another group of gay men who are concerned with their body, and that we heard John Bartlett talk about a little yesterday, um, are as concerned with their body as with the garments that clothe the body as the bears. This subculture, and I use that word advisedly, strove for a particular presentation of masculinity that drew on icons of real working class masculinity. As Silverstein and Picano noted, the look was initially, and I quote, natural, rural, even woodsy. And the bears were just regular guys, only they're gay. Similarly to bear culture's initial rejection of mainstream club culture, Benoit Denizé Lewis notes that many black and Latino men have, have, quote, settled on a new identity, down low, that rejects a gay culture they perceive as white and effeminate. Hypermasculinity was thus at the heart of being down low, and stylistically, these homo thugs, a term that's used by lots of people, including the Latino club DJ Alfonso King, drew their influence from hip hop culture, wearing low slung oversized jeans, revealing branded underwear, waistbands, hoodie sweatshirts, the typical signifiers of hip hop style. Black and Latin gay men and transvestites bonded in their own versions of gangs known as houses and would vie with each other in walks at balls. Dressed in masculine clothes of white Wall Street executives and the straight black homeboys or feminine styles of Parisian supermodels, these queens competed for the title of most real, recreating elements of the life they saw on television in white America and around them in the black, primarily heterosexual ghettos where they lived. These voguing balls were introduced to a wider audience, of course, by Madonna in 1990 with her single and accompanying video Vogue, and Jenny Livingston's documentary Paris is Burning, which documented the lives of um, the houses at balls and the everyday life of their participants. London drag artist gay Co Guy Common notes the appropriation of drag influences in clubs in London, stating, any club you go into, there's 15, 18 year olds in a wig and lipstick. Joe Harris notes that the visibility of all forms and variations of drag, rather than reinforce stereotypes about what gay men look like, has had an effect on perceptions of people, of gay people and acceptance. He says, it's definitely easier to come out when you have drag queens running around you. Cross-dressing drag and gender play have used both the stage and the nightclub as sites for expression, and newer drag performers such as Johnny Wu and Scotty in London, Taylor Mack and Acid Betty in New York, amongst many, many others we could mention, Mix up semiotic messages in the spirit of genderfuck, which as sociologist Peter Hennan noted, blended gendered shades of grey instead of the black and white elements of masculine and feminine dress seen in more conventional parodic drag styles. Sociologist Peter Hennan, amongst others, records how personal ads placed by American gay men now routinely include phrases such as straight acting and appearing and no femmes reflecting what Robert Brannan has termed the relentless repudiation of the feminine. This skinny look, sometimes associated with the hipster style, is prevalent amongst young gay men, is reinforced by Alex Jeffcoat, who described his own style identity as skinny jeans, regular t-shirt that had a cool print, and says he would, and I quote, have difficulty saying whether my style has had gay influence or not, because a lot of the crowd I hung around with was hipster. 
and a number of my interviewees in both London and New York identified the hipster look as one which blurred boundaries between gay and straight style. Joe Harris in particular noted, straight hipster guys look very gay and the gay hipsters look very straight. In 1993, cultural commentator Michael Bracewell wrote, I quote, there is no longer any us and them in fashion terms. What remains are more simple notions of style which adapt to the sexuality of the individual, end of quote.